Hello and welcome to the Riptide After Party, the party where everyone's welcome, particularly if you're a mystery opponent. Ooh! Is there a mystery co-host? Well, there is, because the, the co-host today has not been here for the last few episodes. Welcome back, Adam. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I have listened to the last few episodes and... Uh, it's been a bit of a nightmare because I keep chipping in and saying stuff and you guys don't respond. Yes, because, it's hard to do that yeah. when, you're, when you're not in the room with someone. Yeah, and what you were saying happened in the past and I just look very weird. But yeah, uh, great episodes since uh, I haven't been available. Um, good to have Brett on, my pod buddy. He's mentioned in the past he doesn't feel comfortable like socially with stuff. I thought he was great. I thought he did a fantastic job. Yeah, uh, I agree. He's better than he thinks he is, I think, yeah. Brett. Yes, but it's a pleasure to be back, MJ. Yeah. You've done a great job. And Thank you. Um, it's obviously going to be a great pleasure to talk about another amazing Riptide show. Mm-hmm. Point Break 2019. Yeah. Uh, so we're going to review this, basically, in a moment. Before we do, I just wanted to, uh, to tidy up a couple of little things. Mm-hmm. Um, the first thing is, during the show, there was a charity fundraising drive. Yeah. For the Clock Sanctuary, which helps the homeless of Brighton. And I'd like to just say, if you go to the cts.org.uk, they basically help the homeless people of Brighton with... It's not just like giving them money for food, but it's things you may not think about, like deodorant or shaving equipment or underwear, fresh clothes, things like that. Mm. It just makes a, makes a real difference to people's confidence as well as how they present themselves if they go for a job or for accommodation, things like that. Yeah. So it's just, it's just a good society and I just I, I wanted to use this opportunity to, to just put that out there. Yeah, good stuff. I saw on the day, well, the day after the photo um, that Riptide put out there of all the donations that they had on show day, a lot mm-hmm. of the fans had, had come down and brought stuff, clothes and sleeping bags and all sorts of good stuff. So yeah, really cool. Yeah. And something else just before we do the reviews, coming up later, I'm going to have three interviews I got on the day of Point Break, which were with the referees. Right, so it's a Point Break 2019 review. Big elephant in the room, I suppose, is going to be the mystery match. And it had such a big reaction that if we were to do this review chronologically, it would almost... uh... I think we'd just both be itching to get to that. So we're going to actually discuss that first, as well as one other big incident that happened. And after that, we'll discuss the remaining matches. Yep. There is one thing I wanted to point out, just because I was at the show with a first-time wrestling attendee, Riptide, put together these A4 printouts, yeah. which explained the rough rules, you need to pin someone, submissions, top overview stuff, Yeah, but very useful if you're walking into the first time going, what have I got myself into? Yeah. Um, so I just, I just wanted to say, I thought that was a really good idea. I've never seen any promotion do that anywhere. No, and we've heard a lot of Josh and Tom saying that they really want to get their mates who aren't into wrestling into wrestling and just mm-hmm. get a lot of first-time wrestling viewers in. Yeah. So, yeah. If you're going to do that, then at least it stops you, MJ, having to turn every five <laughs> yeah. minutes and explain what the hell's going on. So, yeah. yeah really, Especially really as she was idea. stood behind me, so it would have really hurt my neck to do that constantly. Right. Was she the one? Because I looked over at you mm. uh, during the show. Was she the one who got a lot of grief from Paul Robinson? Or was that? Yes. Really? Okay, so let, you know what, let's touch on this. So, let me promote her because she is called Jazz Vegas, J A S Z. Vegas. Is she's she a, a wrestler? No, she's never been to a wrestling no, no, show no. because she's always... No, no, she's a professional magician. So okay. she understands showbiz and... and right. Um, I, 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 this is coming across like we're close friends. I barely know her. I was in a group with Craig and Ali, who are Riptide regulars, and she's friends with them. Right. And we all met at a barbecue two weeks ago. I see. And Jazz was there, and we talked so much about Riptide, she went, I'm buying a ticket, I've got to come. So that's why it was her first show, and that was why when she got oh she got both barrels yeah she I think I, she coped brilliantly with I it. I suppose she's used to being heckled on stage, perhaps. So, but surely not <laughs> by someone like Paul Robinson. No, no, I she, hope not. Anyway, what kind of yeah backstreet magicianing is she doing? Magicianing? <laughs> yeah, we'll leave that. I, yeah, we'll leave it that. Um, <laughs> and like I say, these flyers they helped her understand what was to be expected. So brilliant. Um, yeah. and just thank you to Craig Alley for the barbecue because it was great. Now. Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks, Greg and Ali. <laughs> Let's talk about Cara Noir. Cara Noir. And his mystery opponent. Obviously, it's something that Rosa was uh, teasing. Mm-hmm. She was trying to get people to guess. Yep. Um, she was... Uh, this is a little note uh, for Rosa. And that sometimes she does a bit of crowd interaction, and she's doing an absolutely brilliant job. But every so often, she'll ask the crowd a question, mm-hmm. and they'll reply, and she'll go, oh... But mm. obviously the rest of the crowd haven't heard it. Yeah. So there were a few times when she was getting people to guess and we couldn't hear what they were guessing. Um, so it might have been interesting to have heard that. But Yeah, it can be good to feed back with, oh, you think it's going to be The Undertaker? Yeah, and then, they are, and then the yeah. crowd can, can respond to that. Mm-hmm. But that is obviously an absolutely tiny, minor mm-hmm. thing. People were speculating, though. I can go into a, a small amount of the background detail of this. Yeah? So the Do it. So, okay, so the mystery opponent, for anyone who isn't aware, and I can't imagine you're not going to stay, if you're listening to the podcast, you follow Riptide, um, the mystery opponent was Pac, a.k.a. Neville, formerly from WWE. Yeah. 
What follows, listeners, was the true story of how Pack was booked. It involved orphans, dinosaurs, explosions, time travel. And by true, I mean none of that happened. The truth of it is, this is how Pack was booked. This is the official word by Riptide Management. It was going to be Spike, but Pack turned up in his pants, ready to go. I like to think uh, Geordie turning up in his pants is basically just how Geordie's dressed for a Saturday night out. I mean, it's not just jackets that are for wimps, it's trousers too. And now, back to the podcast. Mm. And I think it worked out well for him. He looked to be having a good time. Oh, it worked out brilliantly for him. Definitely. Definitely. Just, yeah. Anyway, we'll get into more detail on that in a second. But so, yeah, so the the, Point Break 2019 was pushed around who will um, Karen Noir's opponent be. Mm -hmm. Karen Noir never yet won a match in Riptide. No. He's the only person featured on the poster. Yeah. So it's safe to say he's the main event of this day. Definitely. And the mystery opponent turned out to be Peck. And uh, there was an amazing ripple effect where. People on one side of the stage, as he was approaching the ring, could see him coming out behind the curtain. So you saw one half of the crowd go, oh my God, it's back, it's back. Oh. And the side I was on couldn't see that. Well, I was um, seated, and actually we'll get we'll get onto that because I want to talk a little bit about that a bit later mm-hmm. on. But um, I was sat next to some guys I, I don't know, um, and as soon as the music hit, they went, oh my God, it's back. Mm. So obviously familiar with his work on perhaps seen him at other promotions. I wasn't familiar with the music. I was talking to the other guys from Hardest Part of the Ring, trying to guess, and I, I sort of said, it's not going to be Pack, is it? Like, how great would it be <laughs> if it's Pack? So obviously when he did come out, or when I heard the guys next to me say it was Pack, I was pretty excited, and yeah. when he actually walked out, that response. Yeah. I mean, we've had some big pops in the Bright Home. That was one of the big ones, though. If not so. the biggest. In terms of yeah. entrances, it's going to be that, it's going to be Viper, and it's going to be Thatcher yeah. coming out. But, all, I mean, uh, yeah, and he, he seemed to lap it up. Yeah. We saw we, there's been gifts going around on Twitter. There's a little smile that came out. <laughs> well, he's known as the bastard. Yeah. So he's, he's grimacing on stage, but, quite, you know, you've seen the eyes. He's, yeah. he's enjoying it. Yeah, and it's a lovely looking venue, you yeah. know? So, uh, yeah, everyone was delighted. Yeah. Brilliant booking. Yeah, it was a wonderful surprise. And, of course, it's interesting that if you had put Pack in advance on a poster... It would have sold out. Yeah. Now the show virtually sold out. I think it was like five tickets or so that didn't. But yeah, there you it was, go. It was basically near sell out. But there's more value to be had sometimes in Satan. We did this as a surprise. So at this point, Riptide or mystery opponents have had Pete Dunn, mm-hmm. Viper, and Pack. So the next time they announce here's a mystery opponent, yeah, people might want to go. Holy shit! Let's get tickets. Yeah, and it. Uh, uh, Every single show, there are people on the show that you had no idea were going to be there. Yeah. That's one thing that Riptide always do. They book a lot more talent than you're expecting to turn up. Yeah, and I think you're right. That's that, that's going to encourage more ticket sales. Mm-hmm. And a, a lot of the guys that I was talking to saying, could it be Pac? They're like, well, surely they would have announced that first. Mm-hmm. It makes sense. They would sell yeah. more tickets. But they didn't need to. Didn't they basically to. sold it out anyway. Yep. Yeah. So, so, so we've bigged up what the surprise was. What about the match? Pac versus Karen Noir. It was all right, I thought. <laughs> Solid three stars. Three? <laughs> well, minus three. No, it was brilliant. It was absolutely brilliant. It, it, I mean, it technically wasn't the last match of the night, but it was the main event of the day. Yeah, definitely. Um, I've heard a lot of stuff since Pat came back, and I have watched a couple of his matches, but I've heard people sort of say that when he first came back and, and some of the shows he's been doing around the country have been a little underwhelming. I can't comment on that because I haven't seen them all, uh, but I do listen to other wrestling <laughs> podcasts, of course. And so I was really intrigued to see what kind of show he'd put on. You might mm-hmm. be thinking, oh, I'll just come and do half a job here. I'm going to get paid. I'm Pac. Everyone's happy to see me. Yeah. But it seemed to me like he brought his absolute A game. So touching on what you're, you're talking about from previous show reputation, yeah. I've seen him in a couple of other companies and... I didn't think he half asked anything, but because he's the heel, he teases doing his high fly moves. And yeah, he doesn't yeah, do them yeah, okay. Because he wouldn't, because he's not trying to make you like him. Yeah. So I could see why some people might see him in other programs. Oh, I saw him and he didn't do any of his flippy stuff, because that's not what he's there to do. No. At Riptide, we did get a couple of them. Yeah. That's because it was telling the story of he had to do it to beat Noir, because Noir was just tougher than he was expecting. Yeah. If you want to see how good, how hard work in pack is, Watch his turnbuckle sales when Noir throws him headfirst into turnbuckles. Shit the bed, yes. It was like someone throwing a dart at a dartboard. Yeah. You don't do that if you're turning up to go, oh, I just want to get my money and go home. Yeah, exactly. That was that was a big thing I wanted to say, is that his selling was phenomenal. And yeah. he he did, he really did seem to bring his A-game. And having watched it back again on YouTube, because uh, obviously we should say that the match is available on YouTube mm-hmm. for anybody who hasn't seen it on the Riptide Wrestling. But the fact that they yeah. got that out quickly was a masterstroke. I was yeah. speaking to people and um, on the way home, and one of the guys was saying they need to get this out on YouTube. Yeah. It will it will 
be amazing. It will it will just really shed a load of light onto onto Cara, and obviously, a load of people will come to it just because it's packed. Well, you mentioned earlier about the gifts and all that. That wouldn't happen if it wasn't out on YouTube because there's footage for people to make gifts out of. So yeah. you're right. You're absolutely right. Yeah. And, and, and also, at this point, sorry, we're saying how amazing it is they booked Pack and it is and the reaction to Pack. Mm. It was great and he was working hard. We haven't mentioned Cara that much yet. And he, you know, he deserves a big mention here. Yeah. You want to talk about putting your work boots on for a night? Ooh. I know. I mean, how long was that match? Like 25 minutes? Yeah, something like something that. Like that. And, uh, and then he had another one. And then he had another one. And it was another match. Yeah, yeah. it wasn't a 30 seconds and you're done. Um, yeah. We'll, we'll focus on the second match later. But it's really telling the story that he can't quite get a win. The mm. crowd have really built him up now. And he's built his rep on, he doesn't win, but he puts on the show, he puts on the event you, you remember. So having him versus Pac just felt right. Well, he himself is an event. Yes. Uh, like the whole package. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously his entrance is just... Everybody has fallen in love with that. And just the drama that is Cara Noir, even before he's he's taken off his wings, you know, mm-hmm. it's, it's just it's amazing to be a part of and to see. And I think if you'd said a couple of, I don't know, maybe a year ago that he'd be headlining, you might be like, oh, really? Okay, that mm-hmm. guy, that guy with the see-through tights that he used <laughs> to have. You're like, mm. But every single show, he's just improved, improved, improved. Yeah. And everybody goes away in love with Cara Noir. Mm-hmm. He is a superstar and we're watching his, his ascension right now. Yeah, it's exciting. Yeah, it I, don't, I don't know. And, and then the interesting thing is the differing opinions you get online of people being like, this is incredible, I can't wait to see him get mm-hmm. signed up. Yeah. And then other people going, oh God, no, he's going to get signed up. <laughs> what camp do you fall in? You just want the um, best for him. But, well, no, split, because I want what's best for me as a viewer. I yeah. want what's best for him as a human being. Yeah. You know, these people work extremely hard. And they should deserve to earn the most money they can in the time they have. Yeah. Um, I mean, he, he said. I'm uh, of the opinion what he prefers. Some people genuinely don't want to sign to big companies. Some people do and want to make the money. Whatever's good. He said he doesn't want to go to WWE. In, uh, there was an interview on 24 Wrestling, um, a really good interview with him about the whole character and his in ring style. And one of the things they, they said, you know, what promotions could you see yourself working at? He said, anywhere but WWE. Hmm. Well, there you go. So, yeah. So, there you go. My answer is whatever suits him. Yeah. So that was the main event, but it bled into a, a, a following on event because after the match, Spike Chavay came out and pointed out that, for reasons we'll explain in a moment, he wouldn't be able to take on Jack Sexsmith for a title shot opportunity, which had previously been established. So mm-hmm. instead, Chavay bullied Josh into putting the, the match against Karen Noir for the title shot. Yeah, and Josh, then getting got, Josh getting involved. But then we had a second match. As we said, it wasn't a quick throwaway done deal. No. It was great. It it went on. They they went at it. I don't know if Noir got paid twice. I hope he did. <laughs> I bloody hope so. I hope he got paid by the minute. <laughs> yeah. Spike. Um, once again, I mean, let's give Spike some credit because it's easy to become the caricature of the Tory. Oh, you can boo me. He doesn't. He comes out. He's vilified. He is hated. Mm-hmm. And he played it up wonderfully. Like of course, um, we had um, Damon Moser and Shea Purser come out mm-hmm. with with the chair initially. The, that's the refined version of Money versus Everybody now. Yeah, yeah. of course. Version two. Yeah. Of course, Spike did win to become the new number one contender for the Brighton Championship. And it tied up the loose ends that had been loosened earlier on in the show by Jack Sexsmith. Uh, Obviously, we're going to talk about that. Yeah. But we now sort of know what everybody's going to be getting up to or what's going to be happening moving forward in terms of we have a number one contender, we've got the champ, we've got all these other things that are Mm -hmm. going on. And I just thought he dealt with it really well. Yeah. And then we also got the beautiful, um, just to go back to the YouTube, the Spikes promo at the mm-hmm. end of that video. Yeah, the James Muscle White promo. God, he's good. <laughs> well, he's bad. Oh, but he's good at being he's bad. He's so good. The, the, the sort of 30 second bit at the end of that where he's just looking down the camera. It's yeah. just absolutely brilliant. Yeah. And actually, just I made a note on this. That video, in five days, had 5,000 views. Mm. Pretty good. Um, I think I, I thought, oh, I wonder if this is the most viewed Riptide video. And I had a quick look. I was expecting it to be. Mm-hmm. Um, is it our podcast no 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 no. Um, <laughs> we're in your 4,900 yeah, 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 yeah exactly yeah uh, <laughs> but can you guess what the most popular video is you probably can if... I would guess it's the Dave Benson Gunge match oh no that is I think that's third most okay. popular I think that's got about 4,000 okay this is outstanding yeah the most popular video on there is the free match between Keith Lee Matt Riddle and ah. Jimmy Havoc as you'd expect, probably, because they're all big yeah. names now that people are going to be searching for. 
74,000 views. And that's from the Point Break 2018. Yes. Um, Point Break, let's keep it going, people. But 5,000 views in five days. Yeah. And it's, I've, I've absolutely loved watching all the reaction coming in from around the world. Like, yeah. I really take a weird sense of pride in seeing people from America yeah. finding this mm. and being like, oh, what's Riptide? And what is this? This looks great. And this is a great match. And this is the best pack match I've seen since he's been away from WWE. I need to get more involved in this. Well, what's, what's fascinating is, is in the, in the mid nineties, I would have you know, given my right teeth, my right teeth. <laughs> no. Okay. No, I'd have given several teeth and a right arm perhaps to have gone to the, uh, the Hammerstein ballroom to watch ECW back in the day. Yeah. I would hope, you know, if someone has the money, someone in the States is like, God, I want to go to Brighton and see Riptide. I would hope someone makes the journey. Yeah. Cause you know, it could be, it's a lovely environment. It's a lovely show. And I hope someone can get, some wish fulfillment out of attending a show. Definitely. Yeah. Especially a summer show down in Brighton. Yeah. It's just the place to be. Um, but yeah, look, we've danced around the Jack Sexsmith thing. Let's get to it. Because this was the other big story coming out of the show. Mm-hmm. Very regrettably, Jack Sexsmith has had to retire permanently as an in-ring competitor. I believe it's too much ACL damage to his knee. What's wonderful about Jack Sexsmith is, being an openly pansexual wrestler, any other era or any other sort of prom- big promotions probably would have presented him in a, in a sort of original gold dust manner of... He's gay. Boo him. Yeah. He's a weirdo. Yeah, definitely. It's quite the opposite. Yeah. And I hope he's... I think... And it's not just him. Charlie Morgan as well. And, a few, and you know, there's other people. But Jack's kind of, I think, the biggest forename in, in British wrestling for doing it. I agree. I think he's made a really positive impact. And I know he loves wrestling with a passion. Unfortunately, the body can only take so much sometimes. And, yeah. yeah. It was a massive surprise. Mm. Uh, I don't know about you, but when he started saying it all... I, well, I mean, you may have had some behind-the-scenes info because you do tend to, MJ. But I was thinking, this this is work. Particularly after mm. what happened with Haskins at Deep Six. Mm. You think, we've seen this before. This is going to be part of it. Trevay's going to come out in a second, smash him. At, you know, something's going to happen. I didn't, I didn't know. I knew he'd been out injured. Yeah. But especially because the excitement. We've had two years of this storyline. Yeah. I, I was willing it. To, to not be true and then he just kept going and he kept talking and it was like oh hold on a minute and then you saw yeah. people in the crowd starting to get emotional yeah. and you're thinking this is actually this is real and then yeah. suddenly you go from oh this is an amazing work to oh shit this is actually a man's yeah. career in wrestling over it's safe to say it was um, difficult and disappointing for everyone involved whether it was Jack or Spike or Josh or the crowd just mm. It's just it's unfortunate for all parties, but obviously for Jack in particular. But that's why I wanted to stress the positive impact he's had. I think I hope he knows. God, yeah. I hope he knows he's changed the game a bit. It's not like he's gone. He like he's a... going to be around in other promotions doing other things. Yeah. Like he's already got um, a commentator role in another company. Yeah, um, TNT, right? Yeah, I think he's he he was a pioneer, and like the connection that he had with the fan base. I know that's a big thing in in the indies is the connection that wrestlers can get but the mm-hmm. connection that he had in particular was yeah. really special because he made everybody feel so included and there are other wrestlers like you said who you know are, are open about their sexuality and that really helps but he was really open about everything mm-hmm. you know his pride clothing line yep. um, all of his merch and that kind of stuff he just made people feel open and confident and they could approach him and talk to him and I know yep. a lot of people consider him a friend so yeah and he and he is he's absolutely he's wonderful at every merch table he made time for I've I even before I was doing the podcast and just attending as a fan I know I asked him for a photo holding a sign for a friend of mine I could see he was in pain he made the time to stop and chat and do it yeah you know and I've seen him do it with everyone whenever he's been in pain he stopped to give them his time and I'll also say this as well he's always been incredibly friendly and polite and chatty behind the scenes like far more than you'd think some people would be yeah best of luck to you Jack and hopefully we'll see you down at the Bright Helm again I'm sure. I'm sure we will. Good. Great. God, that sounded like oh. I was getting choked up. It's oh. just a frog in my throat. <laughs> it's an emotional time, emotional. everybody. Um, so we've got the rest of the card to run down. But before we get to the rest of the card, why don't we cut to the interviews with the referees? And it's like a little palate cleanser before we discuss the rest of the we card. We can pull ourselves together. Good yeah. idea. I'm joined by Tom Scarborough, professional wrestling referee. Hey, and, MJ. Uh, hey, he's uh, appeared on all kinds of shows. International television audiences have watched. You're yeah, very lucky. Safe to say, you're a very successful referee in this game. Yeah, I've been very lucky with uh, with all the cool stuff I've done. It was actually my seven year anniversary uh, last month. Don't look old enough. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, the jobs made me feel a bit old. Um, <laughs> and we're here tonight at a very, very sweaty Bright Helm Sunder. Certainly. We've are. been trying to do this for ages. I'm so glad that we can finally well, sit down and have a quick chat. I thought you might have been ribbing me at one point. I keep <laughs> saying yes, and then it keeps cancelling. 
This is Blame TFL yeah. and National Rail. <laughs> I will. Um, so the ref- side audience will know you as, as one of the referees. Uh-huh. There is, of course, Lauren and Aaron, and I'll be talking to them separately. I suppose what I think uh, is really interesting about refereeing is if you're really good at your job, the audience shouldn't notice you unless they need to notice you. Yeah. That's my take. I know this is a tough one to just sum up. What would you say the challenges of doing that, or how do you go about approaching that? No, it's, you're completely right. So th- I think a lot of... Uh, a lot of fans don't really completely understand the role of referee, and you know, and that's fair enough because because our role on the base level is just to officiate the professional wrestling match as good we can and as impartially as we can. And um, but there's so much more layers to it, and a, a lot of people kind of almost take it for granted. A good referee needs to strike the balance of being there and being authoritative and being seen, while also not taking away from the action. Mm-hmm. Obviously, the stars of the show are the, the boys and girls that wrestle, uh, and we're there almost as kind of like a narrator or a director of the piece. Um, and we've got to thread all the little pieces together whilst also not taking over the whole the whole match and it, you know what it is really tough to, to really find that balance and strike strike that balance I suppose leading on from that then is there any aspect you think oh if people only knew oh wow um, blimey that's taking me off I mean, maybe, just, maybe just because just... now it's, it, just, it just all comes so naturally <laughs> um, that's why you're the best uh, nah <laughs> <laughs> nah I've been, I've been lucky enough to work with, with some fantastic refs just from day one been lucky enough to have some brilliant mentors. Um, what, what about on the physical level? Because I can see some knee pads under your jeans. Yeah, I wear knee pads. I mean, like a lot of we're on our knees the whole time. Like I, I wouldn't say to the fans, "Hey, w- watch, watch the refs." But if sure. if you are watching us for whatever reason, we are up and down on our knees a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, essentially, you know, we do burpees in the ring, um, and you know, the best referees are active. They don't they don't just stand there. We are we are again we're active, but we're not active to the point where we're being seen we've got to, we've got to kind of I don't know move in the shadows almost mm-hmm. and like I said yeah that's tough um, like ninjas in white ninjas in white and black zebra, yeah. zebra ninjas <laughs> um, going back to what we were saying about just the toughest the toughest part of the job it's probably all the little small aspects that the crowd don't see we've got a big jigsaw the referees and every little piece kind of adds to the match and we've got to put it all together well, speaking of uh, matches, at the first point break, there was a gimmick match, which was two out of three tables match, which I've never seen anywhere else. Uh-huh. Have you got a favourite kind of gimmick match to work? Oh, match my goodness. Uh, I, I, do you know what? Gimmick matches are tough for referees because if, if, you, if you're bringing in all these random weapons in the ring, we've got to kind of keep out of the way as best we can whilst not getting hit by the weapons, whilst also making sure the wrestlers are still okay and yeah. able to uh, carry on with the match. Um, Whenever there's thumbtacks in a match, I always like to carry a baking tray with me, mm-hmm. um, so I can count on the baking tray. Um, but I'll always find tacks like in the bottom of my feet yeah. or like in my knee pads and stuff. Uh, but luckily, I've, I've never been seriously injured in there. Um, I don't like flying weapons, but yeah, I, I love watching them. I don't like wrestling them. Well, one of the things I do know you for is occasionally you tweet out pictures at gigs. I'm a huge music fan, but I love all kinds of music. We had Wrestle Queendom, Eve Wrestle Queendom last yep. week, and after the show we went to uh, this random jazz bar in Bethnal Green, mm-hmm. uh, and it was just, I was absolutely buzzing. Amazing. Uh, give, me, give me any live music and I'll, I will love it. So tweet me any suggestions that I can listen to on, on the old Spotify. Got Spotify Premium the other day, and the, my Discovery Weekly is, is throwing all kinds yep. of awesome stuff that I've never heard before. So yeah, just tweet me some music, because I... This job, this job is uh, there's a lot of travel, so uh, I like some some good music to listen to. Well, you've heard him, folks. Do that. And hashtag it Riptide After Party. So that like Riptide as well. After Party. Nice. All right. Um, now you're also linked. I think responsible for a little bit of training of some of the next generation of referees. So we've got Aaron and Lauren here. How, yeah. How are you finding working with those guys? So I've been working with Lauren probably year and a half now, maybe. Um, we we work a lot of pro wrestling Eve. Uh, in fact, we work most shows together at Pro Wrestling Eve, and uh, Lauren occasionally uh, comes in and fills in at Riptide as well. Uh, Lauren's doing great. Yeah, she's she's awesome. It's it's good because there's there's not many, if any, female referees in the country. I know of three, I think, from the United Kingdom. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Lauren's doing great. It, it like I said, yeah, it's great, and then she's doing it for Eve as well, which is of course the all female promotion. And really, female referees are the way forward. You know, we kind of seen this women's revolution over the last few years. Uh, and there's also Jessica Carr, who's now refereeing for NXT. Uh, and you've got Aubrey Edwards, who's refereeing for AEW. So female referees are, are getting in and they're getting the spots. And that's good because because they're, you know, they're wonderful workers as well. Lauren's doing great. Mm-hmm. Um, been working with Aaron here for as long as I've been here. So, again, maybe a year and a half now. Yep. Aaron's fantastic. He's he's absolutely brilliant. He improves every single time I see him. Uh, as does Lauren as well. Lauren uh, gets better every time. But I, I see Aaron less. So it's, it's, just, it's nice to see his, his improvement over a longer period of time. 
Um, well, I'm hoping to get them on here, but uh, they might trash you. We'll have to wait and see. Hey, who knows? Maybe they will. <laughs> a lot of people trash me, but hey, I don't mind. But yeah, Aaron's moving back up north, so any northern promoters that listen to this, hey, get him booked. Yeah. And, uh, a lovely chap as well. Uh, just, he's an absolute genius. He, he bought me a coffee. We had a referee <laughs> uh, pre-show meeting mm-hmm. at Mojo Coffee just over the road, yeah. uh, and he bought me a nice coffee. We had a great time. Good man. He's politicking in all the right ways. <laughs> he is indeed. Uh, now we're gonna have to wrap this up in a minute because you've got work to do. Yeah, um, I got I got to go referee yeah. Connor Mills versus Kyle Ashmore, or just Ashmore, is it now? I don't know. Uh, who knows? Hey, Riptide is one of my favourite places to work. I'm just, I, I love Brighton. I love coming down here. Thank you so much, MJ. No Thank you. Cheers, brother. Right, it's my second zebra of the evening. Woo! I'm here with Lauren Carnell. It might be a bit noisy because we're, we're packing up the show. Well, we're not packing up the show. No, no, I've done some packing up. I've you done, done some. I did plenty. Thank so you I'm, very much uh, for helping. It's all right, it's all right. Anyway, we're not here to talk about that. <laughs> uh, I wanted to focus on refereeing for okay. a moment, hence I interviewed Tom earlier. Fabulous. And I'd like to interview yourself. No, no, that sounds um, great. What I said to Tom is, and I think what I found really interesting with refereeing is, if you're great at it, no one should notice you 90% of the time. Absolutely, yeah. Except for when you want to be noticed, obviously. Absolutely. So, what, I guess, what are the challenges with that? How, how do you almost keep yourself invisible when you're in front of everyone? So I guess in terms of kind of keeping yourself invisible, you almost don't think about the crowd. You're very much focused on the match. Mm-hmm. And you're focusing about what your role is in the match. So uh, what are they doing? Are they doing things that you should be saying things about, like rope work and stuff? Are they down for a pin? And the rest of the time, you're concentrating on where am I in the ring? Where are they in the ring? What from their movements can I ascertain that I think they're going to do? And therefore, where should I be going yeah. to make sure that I'm not in their way yeah. from that perspective? Um, so that's so in the main, you don't really think about the crowd. Uh, that is very much what you're focused on. And I got one of the probably best compliments I ever got from Dave Francisco the other day, which was because I normally ref his matches in IWO, and he was watching a show and he went, I've realised how much I don't notice you as a ref. <laughs> and therefore he's like, you're very consistent. And which usually when someone says that, you're like, oh, that's a bit of an insult. But I was actually like, well, thank you very much. That's yeah. so, so kind. Because in the world of refereeing, actually, that's yeah. such a compliment to mm-hmm. be like, oh, I didn't really notice you, but you're really consistent. You're there when you need to be and you're out of the way when you don't need to be. And I was like, oh, appreciate that. I really do from that perspective. That's wonderful. So uh, when you're saying like you've got to stay out of the way and stuff like that, it's a really physically demanding job watching it. Oh, uh, absolutely. So I just, last weekend I had two shows. So I had the Eve show here yep, in Brighton, and then I had Wrestle Queendom, obviously on the Sunday. Monday, I had a muscle in my knee hurt, my hip hurt. You know, if you don't stretch enough, you know, you really yeah. do feel it from that perspective. And so when I first started, I didn't really think about stretching. And now I will stretch before. I Usually I'm quite hype afterwards. Obviously there's a lot of adrenaline, yeah. so I normally stretch when I get home. But yeah, you definitely, you really notice it. You don't notice it at the time. Obviously adrenaline is rushing through you, but you do day later, a couple of days later. A bit like when yeah. you do a gym session, yeah. your body tells you like... Know. What the hell are you doing? No, I'm not a gym person either, to be fair. But no, your body very much tells you. And so it is like, remembering to stretch. I find yoga is really good to just help stretch everything out. Because again, you don't realise how kind of compressed you get with Mm. things. You're more focused on what you're doing. So Maybe I should have led with this, but how did you even get into refereeing? It's it's an odd thing to stumble into. It is, it it is. intentional? No, no, not at all. So um, when I was a kid, I watched wrestling all the time. Uh, I dropped out when I was maybe like 15. Didn't watch it for years, got got in with like a new group of friends maybe seven eight years ago that were watching wrestling I was like it's still going oh my god and the Undertaker's still wrestling and that really shocked me and then I started going indie wrestling about three years ago and I I kind of been IPW and stuff uh, went to a, a progress show and then I saw a seminar that Tom was running mm. for IPW and I went to that seminar with my friend and we made jokes like can you count to three <laughs> you know from that perspective Really enjoyed it, thought it was really interesting. They did a couple of like, follow-up things that were just a few months later at the thing. And then I just started going to the training sessions and just doing the ref bits and a bit of the training. Um, and I was just getting ready to kind of be show ready. And that promotion just kind of disappeared. Uh, and so I went to the London School of Lucha and was like, oh, I'm a trainee ref. I'd really like to uh, referee. And they were like, oh, yeah, well, great, just come training. And then two days later, we were like, do you want to referee our show on Sunday? And I was like, yeah, I'd love to just been refereeing shows since and that's been 18 months now wow yeah I didn't realise you were that new to it yeah I no. guess it's the consistency you uh, you there well. you go so no so and um, by going to London School Lucha and doing Triple L Dan saw me do that mm-hmm. so then when I went uh, to see um, the main Lucha show Emily came up and was like oh Dan was saying that you're a female ref and they invited me to start joining Eve mm-hmm. and so similarly I've been doing Eve just over a, a year and a bit now and it's uh, been, a, been a really good learning experience Great, um, you've been, I don't know if you've been here since day one but you've been here very early on with 
Oh, absolutely. So I came to the first show um, as a punter. Uh, and then I think maybe it was a second or third show. I missed because I actually did a ref seminar. Mm-hmm. You don't get many of them uh, down for RevPro. And Tom was at that. Yeah. Got chatting to Tom. And he was, I was like, oh, I'm a ref. Like, I ref for these places. Oh, great. I'm missing the show tonight because I'm helping out on the show here. So the training was during the day, uh, etc. And he was like, oh, you should come join us. Come help out. And so... I came across then to the next show here, and so I help out backstage, um, do the bell ring in. Hopefully, it's loud enough. Uh, and then, yeah, and that, like they started putting me on the pre-show match and stuff. So, yeah, I've been I've been coming Riptide since the beginning, and probably been involved backstage from about show four. And I I don't want to reduce you to this because you're, you're a good worker, but you are a female referee, and there's not a lot of them. I am indeed a female referee, do and there is not a lot of us to be do fair. Do you find that a positive or negative in terms of bookings like there's Uh, more demand or less demand I think there's more demand so I think there's not many refs anyway when you think of the pool of refs there's not loads Um, but actually sometimes when you're talking to promoters they're like I would really like to have a female ref and so some of those kind of uh, promoters that are really thinking about those kind of aspects of things do really like the fact that I'm female and want yeah. to introduce that into their promotion to give that kind of diversity across. So I think it's, I think it's a balance from that perspective. I think um, it's just really useful to, to be something that's a bit different. Like with wrestlers, you know, sure. when they're a bit different, then mm-hmm. it makes promoters think differently. I think you still probably get a few promoters that similarly, if they're not very good at putting on female matches, probably not like, bothered about having a female ref. But in terms of the ones that I've worked for, they've all been really fantastic. Excellent. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end this then on a question I also asked Tom, because uh, I'm just fascinated. Are there any gimmick matches you like reffing or hate reffing? Oh. So at the moment for me, so obviously I'm newer, it's uh, multi-man tags. There's so much going on. Yeah. Tom, and it's a Tom lot had a mad one today. Oh, my God. His was just, I was like... Bravo, Tom. Bravo, Tom. See that. So that, for me, is one that I'm probably more nervous of. So I don't hate it. I just feel more nervous because I want to do my best. And there's a lot going on. And when you uh, have tag teams like coming in when they shouldn't, as a ref, you're really trying to uphold that. But you also, at the same time, don't want to do anything that upsets kind of what's going on with the match. That's probably the one that's a bit trickier. Uh, In terms of just what I love, I just love, uh, like, refing. Like really good matches in terms of people that I've seen grow as wrestlers. So there's nothing better than continually re- uh, refing for a wrestler. But you see them grow in their matches, and you get to like give them that feedback as you go along. Yeah. That really brings with it a real certain amount of pride for oh, me. Um, don't mind a death match. I did do my first death match a couple of weeks ago that involved uh, fluorescent tubes, yeah. and I must admit I probably wasn't selling fear more than legit fear <laughs> for the amount of glass in the ring. Yeah. It was definitely a next level up in terms of the kind of thing going on in the mm. ring did you find like in the shower the next day there was lots of glass fragments and stuff? yeah 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 you know when you walk out of the ring yeah. like that's not my blood kind of thing so uh, <laughs> no I don't know, you know that sort of <laughs> and that's the wonder of being a referee you just you know you never quite know what's going to happen well thank you very much for, for your time no it's been a pleasure in wrestling you go for the three count and here's my third riff of the evening and I can't even take credit for that pun because he made it before I turned the recorder on what can I say Aaron hi hello good to see you again MJ I mean I've seen you so often and we've not actually had a proper chance to chat right I today have been talking to Tom and uh, Lauren about reffing lovely I'm going to hit with the same sort of questions because I want to get different perspectives on kind of the same aim yeah of course how do you go about uh, doing your job but staying uh, somewhat shadowy to the to the audience um, I suppose really it's just sort of being there when you need to I mean the referee's purpose fundamentally when you take away all the layers of a wrestling match is to be there to ensure the safety of the wrestlers and to ensure the match ends uh, via a legitimate means whether that's pinfall submission count out disqualification they're realistically unless obviously there's a stipulation involved I think referees as a purpose unless any of those things can happen you don't need to be in the way Mm -hmm. you just need to make sure that they're there Um, in essence stay away from the wrestlers so you don't get hit in in the back like I did today stupidly (laughs) um, because I anticipated a pinfall that didn't happen but yeah I think it's just when you've had experience you're comfortable stepping into the shadows and knowing when to step in to check on if a wrestler can visibly defend themselves whether they can visibly see what's going on etc or if you're needed for a pin or submission I think that's just the fundamental part of it and it can potentially get a bit more convoluted than it necessarily needs to sometimes I think and I think it's really just bringing it back to basics 
Well, just to, to touch on the fact you, you unfortunately got slightly in the way earlier. Yes. Not to dwell on it, but yeah. I think what's great is it shows how good everyone is at not doing that 99% of the time. Yeah. Like it, it, you know, little things can happen, but it, it shows how good you all are at staying on your feet and being aware of your surroundings. Of course, and I think one of the main traits of a referee, in essence, is maybe not to be a student of the game, but just that level of anticipation and knowing ahead of time who you're working with is always really good because you can usually anticipate what moves they're going to do at certain times because wrestlers whether they like it or not they follow a pattern usually that is just the reality of you know whether you're with them with an MMA fighter who has a certain combination whether it's a wrestler whether it's a boxer etc but I think as a referee it just helps to know what's going on you know and I think especially now especially with British wrestling and wrestling as a whole actually you know you see all these accounts with GIFs that usually do the GIF what people are going to do their big moves you've got lots of opportunities for video on demand and things like that and it's it's so easy now to actually be aware of what's going on around you so that then when you're actually in that situation you don't get hit in the face that, yeah <laughs> that's a good reason to learn isn't it yeah exactly how did you even get into referring because it's an unusual, unusual way into the business yeah no it is I mean for me I was 12, 13 when I first saw wrestling uh, I'd never seen it before in my life within six months I'd started training because I wanted to wrestle It for me it felt like a magician and I wanted to learn the secrets because yeah. I'm nosy like that yeah. um, I wrestled for a couple of years at a training school in Morecambe which was XWA uh, rendition of what was FWA at the time uh, which had been branched out to Morecambe Wrestling I unfortunately a couple of years three maybe four years after I started um, in a rugby match I was I took a the ball I got tackled and unfortunately someone had stomped on the back of my neck yeah, uh, yeah it was gross honestly um, but I basically they at first, they thought I'd fractured my vertebrae in my neck. Thankfully, I didn't. I was fine. Um, but they basically, it was no physical activity until you feel X amount of, like, this shouldn't happen. Ended up taking about 18 months for me to feel okay. I went back and wrestled. Um, I got hit with one move in the training um, environment. And I was like, oh, something's not right. So, I was, unfortunately, I was like, do you know what? Actually, it's not my place to do it. That's it. Um, however, luckily for me, around the same time, there was an opportunity to referee at Alpha Omega Wrestling in Morecambe, which was run by Kieran Gelke, who I can't love anymore because it's his reason that I'm here. He gave me the opportunity to referee there. Um, I learned from that. And when I moved to Brighton, I got involved with Riptide. I messaged Josh, etc. But yeah, for me, it was just sort of going through the wrestling route and then happening to fall upon it and falling in love with it and still doing it now. Yeah. I suppose I'm okay at it, yeah. give or take. But yeah, that, that was my sort of entree. Well, I, I'd say you're one of the... Uh, I'd say you're associated with Riptide at this stage, but... I suppose so, yeah. Sadly, you will be moving, moving away from the area. Doesn't mean you won't necessarily be working. Yeah, no, I am. I'm moving back to the north, actually. Um, but I'm still coming down for these shows because they're fantastic. I mean, the reaction tonight when you heard Pat come out, you know, it's yeah. things like that. When Viper arrived, you know, yeah. Riptide is, honest, in my opinion, one of the best things that will happen. And I love the whole idea behind the, the ethos behind Riptide aligns with my values so much mm-hmm. that I wouldn't miss it for the world honestly excellent, excellent. well this place is really closing down so I'm going to have to wrap this up with one last question that's fine what gimmick matches do you enjoy working or despise working oh that's tricky I think my favourite gimmick match that I've worked in was one I've only done once and it was ironically it was in this building it was the triple threat two falls to a finish through a table match was which first was point break yes so a year I, ago roughly yeah um, that was bonkers but it was brilliant because it challenged me professionally to realise what was going on mm-hmm. um, some of the worst ones that I found are probably your lucha rules multi-tag yeah. where you've got four teams and they're literally it's just trying to you know there's so many moving parts to that and you're like wait so that person no they've gone they've gone and it's just it's so easy to get lost with it as a referee and fall into the wrong position so yeah that's probably the, the one that I always have to put a bit of extra thought to but the point break match which I really hope comes back because it's so yeah. cool yeah. Um, yeah I love that Excellent. Well, that's a great answer, and I also hope that match comes back. I hope Point Break becomes synonymous with that gimmick match. Yeah, it's got to, hasn't it? Surely. I hope. You, well, you've got the power. Just tell them. The power, yeah. The power. Sure, sure. The power is in your hands, MJ. You can do it. I believe well, the in you. The power of Greyskull will make it happen. Um, thank you very much for joining me, Aaron. No worries. So there you go. Do you feel like you know the referees a little bit better now? I feel like I could move in with each of them into a house, the four of us. Well, you've got to go to Blackpool for at least one of them. No, he's going to move back down. Yeah. No. Great <laughs> interviews as always, MJ. Thank you. I, I actually would like to thank them all for their time because it's 
hard to pin down one performer at a show, let alone three, and they've all got their own their own roles to play every show. So thank you very much, Tom, Lauren, and Aaron. Thank um, you, guys. Yeah. Right, should we get back to the wrestling? Right, let's get back to what we still got. Should we just go through... Each of the matches. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I know that's a crazy thing to do. Uh, well. If we start right at the beginning, we had Mike Bird versus Lion Kid. Yes, the, the opener of the night. Yeah, and the, the fun thing about this is that, I mean, when we go back to the Rumble, do you remember there was a big section in, in uh, the Riptide Rumble, uh, the most recent one, 2019, where Mike Bird and Cara Noir were just going at it for yeah. absolutely ages. Mm-hmm. And I did think that was going to be the next feud mm-hmm. for Cara Noir. And then all of a sudden he's headlining and he's up against Pat. Yeah. What a rise. But I would have liked to have seen that. Well, it, it, it you never know. It could come to pass. But it all makes sense because Mike Bird's uh, current gripe is that he doesn't like sports entertainers. Yeah. He's a professional. He doesn't want the larger than life characters. Yeah. So it makes sense he had a problem with Noir and now he's got a problem with uh, with um, kid with Lion Kid. Yeah. You are going to say Kid Like us then, aren't you? No, I was going to say Kid Lion. Okay. I was going to combine the two somehow. Um <laughs> Yeah, you don't get much more sports entertainment no, uh, he's, he, yeah, than Lion the embodiment kid. right there. He really is. So this this is a tough one for me to review, and I'll, and I'll be completely honest as to why. I have tremendous respect for Mike Bird and Lion Kid. There's a butt coming. There is a big butt. I like big butts. There is a big butt coming. Oh, I, uh, about that. <laughs> I, I, I say this with respect to them. I have never been interested in either one as a wrestling character. That is so, so disrespectful. I'm sorry. <laughs> Now, it doesn't mean, I'm not saying it was a bad match, I'm just saying if I don't yeah. connect to either person, I'm going to sit there and go, eh. I couldn't tell you anything about Lion Kid's wrestling style or ability, to be honest with okay. you. And, and I mean, that that's probably a bit harsh. Um, and if Lion Kid, if you're listening, there's no doubt that you've got talent there, but your gimmick is such that it's all about you, it's all about when is Simba going to come, yeah. it's all about the fun and the comedy, and it's perfect, and it works well. Yeah, it is. Like, if it sounds like I'm being harsh, no, he no, is no. perfect at that character. And get, doing what needs to be done with it. Yeah. It's just not for me personally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, you're being honest and that's yeah. all we can ask for. <laughs> um, but yeah, I thought it was a good a good fun match. But, you know, opening match, there's no need to, to go too in depth into it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we had Sexsmith come out, of course, mm-hmm. uh, which we've discussed. And yep. then after that, we had our champion, our Brighton champion. Yeah. In the second match of the night. Yeah, rolling straight in. As soon as Sexsmith was coming off stage, the next match was beginning. Yeah, yeah, they had a hug on stage, didn't they? Yeah, it was a nice moment. That was a good moment. Uh, yeah, so we had Mambo versus... Jordan Brakes. Ah, Brighton Champ versus Brighton Hero. Yeah, um, precisely. I'm going to say right off the bat, in some ways I think this was a match of the night. Mm-hmm. I think Pac Noir probably was because of the, the reaction, but I think Mambo and Brakes had the worst spot on the card. The hardest spot of the ring, if you will. To try and come out after Jack Sexsmith's beloved hero has said he's retiring, and then try and get the crowd back up after only one match. Yeah, it's a nightmare position to be in, There's and they did it. People crying, and yeah. then they've got beach balls falling on top of them. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's Quite a the horrible position. position. It's like imagine if you're a stand-up comedian who's got to go on after someone's just after Tommy announced... Cooper. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I think respectfully, in many ways, they had the best match of the night. If you're viewing the match as how you get the reaction from the crowd, yeah, to turn the whole crowd around, I think was really something. I think yeah, they both deserve a tremendous amount of praise for it. Yeah. Well, we haven't highlighted, of course, is that it was not a title match. No. Just in case there's anyone listening to this yeah. who, who, you know, don't know anything about the event, haven't seen mm-hmm. it yet, mm-hmm. it could well be. And the reason why it wasn't a title match? Because there was already, uh, theoretically, Jack Smith was the number one contender. So there was no need for a, you can't have a second number one contender. Yeah. Um, as well as Jordan Brakes is currently in the Pride of Brighton tournament, which will... Possibly guarantee someone a title shot down the line. Yeah. So and Spike and Jack were going to have that match. Yeah. With potential, the potential of, of of Spike taking that number one contendership. So so at the time it was all arranged. It was more of a showcase match. Yeah. And it still is. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, as you say, Jordan is uh, a local hero. Mm-hmm. Somebody who's been having great matches. Yeah. At just Riptide. winning the crowd over event by event. Like you, yeah. He was popular before, but you see it if you go back and start watching the last three or four in particular. The crowd's really just swelling behind him. Yeah, now. definitely. And it's through hard work. It That's is. Doing it. And the fact is that he, he he's doing really well. He's on this upward trajectory, but he's not ready for a title shot yet. Yeah. So what a great opportunity for these two to be able to, to mm-hmm. have a match together. And they worked really well together, like yeah. you say. I mean, it was quite, quite an old school feel to it. Mm-hmm. I think Brett on the way out said that it had this sort of like a world of sport feel. 
As yeah, in the old did. school. Yeah, they sport, were not the more recent. <laughs> no, they were they were playing around and having fun until the time was gone. Um, but I like that. I think that's a great story within a story. Yeah. Which is, hey, it's a showcase match. Why would we really go at it? And then as you start going on, you go, well, hang on, I've got something to show you. Yeah, and we're two faces. Yeah. You know, we're obviously, we get on well. We're both popular with the crowd. Yeah. Uh, Mambo brought out the whole uh, telephone thing. Yeah. It might be Johnny Saint. Hello. <laughs> that was excellent. Yeah. And Mambo's great at yeah. those kind of matches. The comedy that then turns serious. Yeah, he really is. Um, and But Brakes held his own. I didn't think he felt out of place in the main event. Like, okay, he didn't win it. He's not the next champion or he's not the next contender. Mm-hmm. But he didn't feel out of place. He didn't feel like, what are you even doing up here? No way. Yeah. There, there was no sense of like, oh, isn't that nice? They're giving the local boy a shot yeah. against against the champ. He he held his own. Mm-hmm. He could have won. And I wouldn't be surprised if we were to see that match as the title match later down the line. Yeah, and, I, and I'd really look forward to it after this one. Yeah. It was... It oh, was it's exciting. What are they going to do with Jordan now? <laughs> oh, it's exciting. Sorry, carry on. I'll anyway. tell you, the only thing they're not going to do with him is go bowling with him. Because... Uh... Oh yeah, you sent me a, a picture. <laughs> These guys went bowling. Yeah. Jordan, honestly, that bowling score was dreadful. <laughs> they could have put the bumpers up for you. You just needed to ask. I'm going to stop laying into you now, Jordan. You're a fantastic um, wrestler. In, a, in all fairness, he's challenged me to Laser Quest now, and my first oh my, my first reaction was, "Mate, I am twice your size. Uh, any, I'm I'm going to move and huff and puff, and you're going to shoot me at a distance. I've got no any, chance." Any other sort of twelve year old kids' parties theme nights out plans? No, that's that's it for now. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to go to pizza after and have <laughs> bot- bottomless ice cream. Anyway, let's move on swiftly from let's that wonderful swiftly. match. Let's let's roll on. What was next? Next up was the four-way tag, mm. uh, and this is something Riptide always do so well. Yep. Um, again, like every so often when we're doing this podcast, I'm like, hold on a second, this is the official Riptide podcast, and we're just sitting here talking about how bloody brilliant they are. Yeah. But that's what happens when they do a <laughs> bloody brilliant job all the time. Yeah. And there's some, there might be a couple of negatives coming up, who knows. But they always do so well at booking these multi-man and multi-woman matches. This was, of course... Anti-Fun Police versus Session Goth and Ginny versus... Lord Gideon Gray and Curtis Chapman versus Paul Robinson and Shakara. What a selection. Ooh. What a selection. This was, this was just madness from bell to bell. Everyone trying to out-cheat each other. There was only one uh, one sort of heroic team, Session, Goth and Ginny. Yeah. Everyone else was healed. I mean, well, anti-fun place, it's 50-50 because everyone loves uh, loves Federales. But... Of course. Chapman and Gray, you kind of, they're a team that you kind of love to hate. Like, yeah. There's something lovable about the pair of them. Yeah. Uh, anti-fun police as well, as we've said, this sort of blur the lines. Yeah. Shikara and Robbo. It's, it's just pure hate. It's, it's, very it's pure different. hate. And they're doing really well. Yeah, and they, like, as you mentioned, they gave that abuse to the person I was with Jazz. Yeah. Uh, and she took it in a stride more than I would have. I would have probably would have had a little bit of urine down my leg. Definitely. Um, it's one that hasn't, at least I haven't heard people talking about online. I thought it was really good. Mm. Like, the amount of bodies going on and how difficult a job Tom would have had controlling it all. But everyone got their stuff over, like particularly Chapman. I thought Chapman was a real standout in this. Yeah, he was so hateable and slimy the whole way through it. I absolutely loved Chapman before the match, before the bell had even gone. The way he was sort of standing up to Robbo, taking the mick out of the way that Robbo does, like the intense yeah. sort of, yeah. you know, pushing his groin out and pointing his fingers, and yeah. uh, Chapman messing about. His character is is wonderful. He's a, he's a prick, and I say that <laughs> as, as nicely as I can, I suppose. Yeah. Um, I can't say I remember any moves from it. Yeah, exactly. Not. But I remember moments. I remember Chapman faking a tag. I remember Santos saying, hey, don't treat women like that. Yeah. You know, it's, it's about the moments, because everyone's getting their characters over. But yeah, no, no particular spots, because it was just chaos. But What followed on from that one, Em? Next up, we had the match I was probably most looking forward to, because obviously I didn't know who Kara was going to face. Mm-hmm. Uh We've got the self-styled Mr. Riptide, mm-hmm. C.K. Cooper, uh, versus one half of Aussie Open, but an excellent singles wrestler in his own right, Carl Fletcher. Yep. What, so what's your walking away feeling on it? Well, unfortunately, my walking away feeling is I didn't really see it, the match, <laughs> because we had the interlude, didn't we? The first the first break before this match. Yes. Um, and I waited for a little bit because the queue for the bar was huge. And then I thought, oh, I'm just going to have to go and get in that queue. And I got in the queue. And then the match started, and I just stayed in the queue, and I just couldn't see the match. I didn't see the match. Basically, I um, I got I got the drinks that I wanted to get, um, and walked round to to stand so I didn't go back to the seating area too soon and get in people's way, and then the match ended. So unfortunately, I didn't see it. Oh. I didn't really see it. So I'm a bit gutted. So I'm gonna have to watch it on uh, on demand when it comes out on on the pivot share because I'm excited to see it. Well, um, yeah, I mean, I hope you enjoy it. Yeah, 
I mean, that's a side note. Like, like we say, we do try and make sure that we are, you know, straight down the line with, with how we feel about events. Mm-hmm. The difficulty, I guess, with the bar is that, you know, what more can they do? They've got three people working behind that bar. Yeah. They've moved the location a few times. They've tried to try different things. It. Yeah. Obviously, people are going to go and get a drink at... I mean, they, they're doing the double pints. Yeah. So, obviously, that is making an effort to, to have less people going to the bar as often. But, unfortunately, it's not. it just didn't quite work for, for me. The difficulty, I suppose, is that a huge pr- like pro for Riptide at the moment is the bleachers and the mm-hmm. seating area. It looks great. The con to it is that when you're at the bar, because it's raised, you can't really see what's going on, whereas yeah. you used to be able to. I am like 99% in favour of, of all the pros on that side. Like I love, I love the seating area and I love the bleachers. So I'm, it's not a full complaint, it's just, just making that point. Really. Yeah, that's fair. I'm not going to be allowed back on the pod, am I? No. Uh, well, <laughs> let's do a fucking shoot of what yeah. I really feel about Riptide. Here comes a pipe bomb. Well, hey, it just means you can watch it on demand with fresh eyes. Exactly. Next up we had... I was quite surprised by the placement of this. I would yep. have thought perhaps this would have been an earlier one. This was yep. Ashmore versus Connor Mills. Yeah, actually, I thought this would be the opener for the whole night. I yeah. think this is a great one to get the crowd on point, you know, power versus speed, and get the crowd pumped for yep. hard-hitting action. Um it, this was a tough one because I thought this was a perfectly good match. Yeah. There were matches I thought were worse on the card. There were matches that were better. I just thought this was perfectly good. Yeah, I'd agree with that. And I don't mean that to be dismissive to either one of them. They are both great talents. The, yeah, no no wrestling card can literally be all killer. Yeah. We have been spoiled, as we keep talking about at Riptide, that most of the time it's pretty much is, is all good. So... Yeah, there, there, it wasn't a bad match. There were no bad matches, yeah. but this was sort of, it was a match. There was, of course, a run-in at the end as well with OJMO. That was nice. Yeah. I like the fact they're setting up new narratives. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, the, well, basically... Um, Ashmore didn't take well to, to the match and went back to beat up Connor Mills a bit more. Yeah. And OJMO, who trains with uh, Connor, was not happy with that and was like, well, fuck you, buddy. So he ran in to take out Ashmore. Big reaction as well yep. from OJMO. And I love the fact that he's getting a really big push at the moment yep. around around mm-hmm. the country, all sorts of different promotions. Unless you're Dave Meltzer, in which case he's uh, Michael Ozu. Keeps getting the name wrong. Oh, really? Yeah. So he's the OJMO, except for in Revolution Pro, where he's Michael Oku. Michael Oku, yeah. Unless you're Dave Meltzer, in which case he's Michael Ozu. Oh, I'd, I'd be pleased for Dave Meltzer to get one <laughs> of my names wrong. Yeah, OJMO coming out with that reaction was a nice uh, exclamation point to the end of the match. Definitely. I pay more attention to Ashmore now, and he is very good. Yeah, you know, he's, he's wonderful. Um, and honestly, Connor Mills has oh, yeah. only been going for like two years. Yeah. Like, massive ups. He's getting hench as well, isn't he? he? Is, he's getting yeah, big. Yeah, he really is. Next up. Yep. Candy Floss versus Millie McKenzie versus Rob the Gob Lias. Rob, massive fan of intergender wrestling. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely loves everything that Riptide have been doing. And he got two for the price of one here. Yeah. A bog off. Yeah. So again, like this is an example of... I've really enjoyed the story. I've enjoyed the stuff that Rob's been doing with Riptide. I've enjoyed the stuff he's been doing on Twitter. I think it obviously works really well, the back and forth that he's been having with Riptide. The fact that he is so against intergender wrestling yeah. is something that uh, Riptide do brilliantly. The match, it didn't really hit for me. Yeah, no, that's fair. I mean, I think you'll see on my notes how I've got no bullet points. No notes. <laughs> I think we've got such high expectations now of, of Candy. Yeah. Because she's been doing so brilliantly. At she's had some great, great matches. Particularly, I thought, with TK Cooper. Millie McKenzie, unbelievable for her age. Like, she's going to be massive. Massive fan like, of Millie. Yeah, you know, sky's the moon. Sky's the moon? Sky's the moon. I like that. That is a I'm new keeping that. Sky's the moon. Right, ripped uh, off spotty t-shirts yeah. coming out. Sky's the moon, guys. <laughs> and Rob Lyon. <laughs> and Rob Lyon. <laughs> I hope it does. And Rob Lyon has his character down pat. So, as you say, everything on Twitter is perfect. Yeah. Um, so, it sh- I, I feel like it should have lived up to more than it was. It's just, I don't remember any individual moment of it, which in itself is a bit telling, really. Yeah, I think that's only fair that we we tell it how we saw it. And it was, yeah, it, it, was, it was, yeah, slightly disappointed that it wasn't as good as I was expecting it to be. Yeah. But by no means was it a disaster or anything yeah. like that. After that was, of course, Cara Noir yeah. versus the Mystery Opponent, which then led into Cara Noir versus Spike Trevay. That main event just, yeah. uh, it's just probably, uh, it probably is my favourite favorite match match of the promotion for me. Really? Yeah, because... I mean, it's up there, don't get me wrong. I'm just... Uh... Before that, I think it was Speedball Mike Bailey versus Travis Banks, again, yeah. for me. Mm-hmm. But well, having watched that back, Pac versus Cara again, it was, it was better than I remembered it being. 
And I didn't expect mm. that. I thought I'd watch it and go, okay, yeah, it was all right. But it was better. It was more brutal. It was more precise. Mm-hmm. Everything just worked brilliantly and it just, it flowed. It was just an astonishing match. I loved it. I mean, yeah, I mean, we've, we've already waxed lyrical about it. Yeah, that, I know. Right? I didn't even mean to do that. Then. No, no, it's fine. Yeah. It, you know, I, 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 I think for me, Cooper Mambo just edges it. But it was wicked. It was a, it was a hell of a hell of a high to end on. I'm counting both of the last two matches as the main event in this context. Karen Noir came out an absolute megastar. Yeah. Pack and Spike won, and there's great storylines to move on from that. But Noir came out as the guy you just remember, I think. Totally. Great event. I've got one other thing I still need to touch upon, actually, from, from today. Oh, you're not going to ask me to come up with some sort of fantasy no. wrestler? Or, no, we haven't okay, okay, got, we got, we got the time, quite frankly. <laughs> um, no, it's just something that popped up on the Facebook group chat, and I just think it's worth addressing, which is sometimes you get pockets of fans who are shouting inappropriate stuff. It could be sexual things about the female wrestlers. It's inappropriate however you cut in life, not just for a wrestling show. What I wanted to address with this is, if you hear something, tell security. Because you're not expected to police the crowd. You are a paying member of the audience. If, if something has wound you up that much, have a word with security. They will address the problem. And I know Riptide say at the start of the show, if you've got a problem, address security. And they had flyers up all over the venue saying, if you have an issue, address security. No one is going to mind. They're not going to just disregard your opinion. They will investigate. Yeah. I think by all means, I mean, it's, it's, it's still good to point these things out after the event. Because... Yeah, Rick, Rick Tide are, are going to want to know that these things are happening. I mean, I can see why people might feel like they can't do it if they're standing right next to the person and the security person's a bit yeah. further away. But yeah. at the next break after the match, yeah. at the next interval, or or mention it to to a friend yeah. who might then go and mention it to security. Yeah. You know, some people might not feel confident or comfortable Absolutely. going up to a member of security. Obviously, they should. Do you know some what? People even, might not. even if it's not a member of security, you can say it to the barman. They will take it to security for you. You know, yeah. it's, it's a friendly. It should be a friendly environment. It's planned to be a friendly environment. It is a supportive environment, I believe, and I hope. Yeah. Just say it to MJ. <laughs> yep. Anyway, I think we should wrap this up. Yeah, I've got a feeling should. this is going to be a long uh, episode because we've talked yeah, about we've, a whole yeah, load of matches. Yeah, yeah. We've got three interviews with refs. Yeah. I'm not even going to promote the next show, which is uh, at the end of August. Which is Bank Holiday Wrestling, Bank which Holiday. is happening on the Bank Holiday in August. Right, and open air theatre. Two shows in one day. I'm not even going to promote the fact that it's family friendly. Oh, I'm not going to promote that so because we cheap. haven't got the time. Hey, I'm going to take my three-year-old daughter. Could be the worst idea I've ever had. Could be the best <laughs> idea I've ever had. <sighs> anyway, yep. t- what about next podcast? Any ideas? Um, no. Something will strike some... Yes. Brainwave. Well, by all means, listeners, if you have any amazing yeah. ideas or things you want to hear us talk about, uh, obviously the next podcast will have, most likely, will have Josh and yep. or Tom on it because yes. it's not going to be a review. Yep. Then get in touch. How do they get in touch? They can follow us on Twitter. Uh, well, first of all, you can just generally put hashtag Riptide After Party. Uh, and as you'll remember, Tom mentioned that in his interview, if you want to tweet him some music. But separate to that, you can find myself on Twitter, which is at you underscore total underscore cult. For me, it, well, the best option is probably at Hardest Part Pod, which is obviously my other podcast, Hardest Part of the Ring. Uh, I look after that Twitter account. And also, to be honest, I'm on the Facebook, both the Riptide page and the Riptide fan page. I'm on both fairly regularly, so if you have any comments, you can leave them for us. Um, I think that's a great place to end on. I think it is. Other than RiptideWrestling.com for all your Riptide needs. Yeah, um, and get on the YouTube. And get on YouTube. Share that match. Yeah, man. Send it to your friends, send Pat it to your Noir. family, send it to your gran. Don't even explain what it is. Just play it to your gran. Get in touch if you play it to your gran. Hashtag Riptide After Party. <laughs> MJ, please uh, wrap this up before I keep going on about people's grands. Thanks and bye. Bye. <laughs>